Hello, and welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled for that you are joining us for another episode of the Creative Confidence Podcast. I'm Kalita Stafford, Executive Director at IDOU, and I'm thrilled to welcome IDOU's or IDEO's uh, newest instructor, you'll find out more in a moment, Deirdre Sermonaro. Welcome, Deirdre. Hello. And Deirdre's joining us today to answer the question, what the heck is human-centered <laughs> systems thinking? So uh, some of you have already joined, but if you haven't, please join the chat. And I'd love to hear where you're from, share where you're um, joining us from today. Uh, Deirdre already had a bit of a pre-party group that is thrilled to have you here. Your fan club's already online, Deirdre. From Ohio, hello. <laughs> so we've got welcome folks. We've got folks all around the world, Amsterdam, Brooklyn, Germany. Thank you for those of us who are joining in your evening or early morning. Uh, Deirdre and I are, are broadcasting. I'm broadcasting from San Francisco. Where are you at today, Deirdre? I am in South Lake Tahoe, so a few hours from you. All right. Well, while people are joining, I love to. I love to. Will you share share and show something in your space in your home, so we can get to know you? Sure. This is going to take a second. He's moving away from the mic. Oh, <laughs> and just pulled this into is my the dog. He's this, huge. Or she. Is, he. This is my puppy Crosby. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he is named after my favorite hockey player. And he's huge and heavy, <laughs> but oh. wanted to be included in the podcast today. For those of you who can't see it, Crosby is a very large golden retriever, it looks like. Yes. Yes, golden retriever. And you just want to hug him. And he's bigger than Deirdre, I think. <laughs> Merely. <Merely-based>. Crosby. <laughs> So hockey, hmm. do we have any other hockey plan, hockey fans? Love it. We have other guests calling in also, also uh, acknowledging their pets. So about Deirdre, let me, let me give you an intro. So Deirdre is a senior director and co-leads our systems and strategy practice at IDEO, uh, background in business and psychology and a former architectural designer, which is all part of why you're so amazing at systems, which we're going to talk about. Um, much of Deirdre's work at IDEO has focused on designing educational systems, and she holds a BA from in Cognitive Science and an MBA from the Yale School of Management. And a fun fact, besides the fact that she loves big dogs, uh, I understand you've biked across the U.S. twice. Is that correct? Yes, twice from Connecticut to Portland and Connecticut to Seattle. So across the U.S. I love it. So uh, spending, I guess you spend as much time outside as you can. That's true. Yes. I'm in the mountains up here today too. Yeah. Wonderful. So dear, just going to talk to us about, again, what I mentioned, defining human system, human centered systems thinking. Um, so we can all understand the benefits of this approach. Uh, and a spoiler alert, nobody needs to be a designer or have a background in architecture to benefit from this way of thinking. And that's why I'm so excited to welcome you, Deirdre. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit too about tools that we can all start to apply and use in how we think about complex problems. So let's set a baseline. Uh, many folks may have heard about human-centered design. Many folks of us have probably heard about systems thinking, but what is human-centered systems thinking? So a simple-ish definition um, is that human-centered systems thinking is a problem-solving approach that combines the analytical tools of systems thinking with the creative methods of human-centered design. And the goal is to ultimately come up with solutions that are more holistic and take into account the needs of all stakeholders while also understanding the dynamics of the system. Wow. So that's still a little bit abstract. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let me give it an analogy. So a useful analogy is if you're building a house, okay. um, architects will take into account the needs of the people moving into the house, obviously. Mm -hmm. And they're also thinking about how the yard will affect the neighbors, how the house connects to the city power grid, what the architectural style of the area is. So in the end, the house is designed to work not only for the family, but for all the stakeholders and the system at large. So to recap, I heard you say a few big ideas in there. So it's, it's, a, it's an approach to problem solving is one. Yes. Um, I really liked how you mentioned it's about getting to holistic solutions. I'll have you say more about that as we go on. And interdependent dynamics. What does that mean? Like interdependencies between stakeholders and people. Can you say a little bit more about what that means? 
Sure. Um, so again, in the analogy of a house, you can, uh, you're going to think about like, what is my, what does my room look like? But also what does it look like facing the street? Where should I place the windows? Um, so there's lots of things that are not just dependent on like your view from your chair looking out, but also is your house symmetrical from the outside? So there's lots of like inner dependencies in ways that are, that affect multiple, um, multiple parts of the system at the same time. And so we'll talk more about that. So you start with the house yes. example, but this can apply to a lot of industries as I understand it. Um, and I would love, I'm going to invite the audience. I would love to hear, put in the chat, what industry or organization um, do you work in? Like we have urban planners. I'd love to just hear different healthcare, ed tech, nonprofit, consulting, software, banking. Deirdre, uh, can systems thinking apply in all these industries? Definitely. Let's go there. I would love to hear, um, like how is IDEO's approach different and why is it helpful to non-designers? Why might it be useful for people in all industries? Uh, sure. So our IDEO's approach is unique, be again, because we combine the analytical and the creative. So it's and not just about how to think about a system, but how to really use the creative methods to then create tangible solutions. So it's both the thinking and the doing. Personally, really believe that everyone benefits from thinking and acting like a systems designer, no matter what industry you're in or what your job title is, because we all face really complex challenges um, in our work and in the world. So challenges where there's a lot of stakeholders or competing incentives or just no obvious solution. Um, and this approach really helps you to see things differently. So to see the interconnectedness of things, to spot patterns, to see things in a way that's more holistic and more human, and then to use the tools of design to actually take action. So not getting stuck in that kind of analysis paralysis. Um, when you see the whole system, it can be a little overwhelming, but using the tools of design to then push past the obvious, ask new questions, spot new um, areas for inquiry and try new ideas and see how it affects things. That's so, that's so refreshing to hear, Deirdre. I like, I appreciate you acknowledging like, it can feel overwhelming. And so part of, part of what you're going to share more of today is, is ways in. So it doesn't feel so overwhelming. And I, I like to, you were saying it's all about thinking. So you don't get at doing. So using the, the creative process and, and tan, make, making tangible impact. Maybe uh, you acknowledge this already. It can feel a little abstract. Can you give us another example? Like how does human-centered systems thinking help surface tangible or innovative solutions in a complex space? Sure. So I'll um, share a story from IDEO um, about Innova Schools. Okay. So Innova Schools started in Peru about a decade ago. Um, at the time, Peru ranked last out of 65 countries in the international, in an international student assessment, just to give you a size of the, really a, a failing school system countrywide. And the goal um, was to create a school system that was affordable, scalable, and excellent to help meet the needs of and uplift the rising middle class in Peru. So sounds like a just, big, big challenge. Big, big, big challenge. Big, big. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're designing a school, students, parents, teachers are obvious stakeholders. And in this case, the needs of teachers were a really interesting design constraint because in a country with really low education rates and with scale as a primary goal of the Nova schools, there was a lack of well-qualified teachers. So the team really started thinking about uh, ways that we might be able to bridge that gap and started thinking about the, how, what role technology might play. This led to several major design solutions, one of which was something called the Teacher Resource Center, which allows teachers to share lesson plans and teaching resources. So less experienced teachers really rely on it and more experienced teachers are expected to contribute to it more. So it was one technological innovation to really help bridge that gap. Um, so teachers, again, obvious stakeholder. Obvious, we yep. also thought, okay. we also thought who else are stakeholders in schools? Um, and although this has obviously been disrupted by COVID schools are still mostly physical spaces. Um, and because one of our goals was 
affordability for the middle class. One of the biggest drivers of cost besides teacher salaries in Peru was real estate. So we actually talked to real estate developers and interviewed them to understand the constraints on that side of the system. And that helped inform where the schools were built, what the sizes of the plots of land are, and how the campuses are designed to be efficient. So it's understanding the needs of stakeholders, both the obvious teachers and the unexpected real estate developers, allowed us to really understand the constraints of the system we were designing within. And then to get really creative and use design to build a school system. I've talked about this a bit, but where all the pieces work holistically together. So in Innova, everything from the technology, the teacher training, the pedagogy, the physical architecture, the brand, and the underlying business model all work together. Um, And so far, Innova has 42,000 students. (laughs) Oh. <laughs> a lot. Uh, and 68 schools, uh, both in Peru, and they've also expanded to Mexico and Colombia. And most importantly, this has led to improved educational outcomes. So the yeah. model is affordable, scalable, and very importantly, excellent. Yeah. What a great example. Thank you for that. And so yeah. I appreciate hearing one thing I took away there was just the obvious and non-obvious stakeholders. And so maybe this is something we can all think about within our own challenges is it is who are the obvious stakeholders, the ones that come to mind? What are some ways that people can think about the non-obvious? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about systems mapping as well. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, there, are, there are methods to like surface that. So think, thinking more broadly about, I mean, in that case, because we were looking at the holistic, we were actually looking at the business model mm-hmm. um, of the school and like, wait, real estate's going to hugely drive the price or drive the cost, drive the affordability. Well, who affects that? Like we should go talk to some real estate developers. Like what are the constraints that we're working within? So sometimes you can use different ways in when you're thinking across and you're like, hang on a second, that's a huge driver of price. What do we know about that? What, who are the humans on the other side of that question that we could go talk to and learn more yeah. about? Got it. That makes sense. You mentioned constraints a couple of times. That can sound like a bad thing, but you make it sound like it's actually a good thing in systems thinking. Constraints are your friend, uh, in systems thinking and in design. Um, I think that's one of the things that can also lead to the sense of analysis paralysis, which it's kind of explanatory what that means when you get too deep in the analysis you just don't, you freeze and don't know what to do anymore. Um, what, uh, Wait, I now forgot the question. The 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 importance of constraints. Oh yes, constraints. It's- I love them. Um, yeah, so constraints can really help you to define um, a couple of things to like root in the ground and then design around. And they're mm-hmm. super helpful because you can actually be more creative with constraints. It's very similar to, um, and I think this is often a misconception of design in general. It's like, oh, blank slate, we can do whatever we want. It's really hard to know what to put on a blank piece of paper Um, and similar to the way that IDEO uses brainstorming. It's actually not a free for all. There's like real rules that we use of like quantity over quality, actually, and having wild ideas and saying one at a time. It's very similar that those kinds of constraints can actually help you come up with better ideas because you know what you're designing within and around. That's so great. You actually, we have some folks agreeing with you and saying to like narrow your problem space and open up the solution space. Totally. So you've given us an example. You've given us, so let's talk about a couple things that we can all bring into our, our practice. Um, I would love to talk about a mindset and a tool. Um, these are big ideas. We're not going to cover them all in depth, but I'd love to give people a sense of, of what, what you use in your practice and how we also might use them in to address some of our own personal challenges. Um, you've talked about holistic or integrated solutions. Um, and I've heard you also talk about zooming in and zooming out. So what is this mindset? And let's start with that. Tell me about that mindset and how is it useful as a systems thinker? Sure. I, zooming in and out is one of my favorite phrases. I feel like I say it every day, um, but here's what it actually means. Zooming out is really stepping back to see the bigger picture and zooming in is leaning forward into the moments or the details. So to go back to that analogy of the house, imagine you're building your dream house. You might zoom in to really design the best closet, 
I, this is going to date me, but I think about like Cher's closet and Clueless, like the most amazing closet in the world that fits your wardrobe and how all your clothes are going to fit into it. But you're also going to zoom out to see your bedroom and how your bedroom fits into your house. And most importantly, you're only going to design solutions that work at both scales. So meaning you're not going to design a closet that's so big. It means you're not going to have a bathroom in your house. You're not going to optimize for just one room. You only optimize for the whole house. So you can think about that same mindset and how it might apply in other places. So another example might be, um, let's imagine you're working on designing an onboarding experience for your company. Okay. Yeah. You might, uh, which lots of people are doing these days, especially virtually, including IDEO. Um, so you might zoom in and think about, okay, this person's joining my team. What are they going to need to get oriented? Who should they yep. meet? You also might zoom out and think, well, that, hang on, they're joining the whole company. Uh, what are they going to need to understand the culture? You might zoom out further. Maybe this person's joining a new industry. What context are we going to need? How can we help them with that? You might zoom back in and actually realize, recognize that each individual has different needs based on their background and their identity. So what pieces of the onboarding process might you customize? You also might zoom in and design something actually tangible and real, like the onboarding checklist um, to figure out who does what and what happens. And you can already see, and I'm talking about this, that this mindset is not linear. Um, I was, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not like here are all the zoom out things and here are the zoom in things. Um, you actually keep zooming in and out to get new perspectives, to try something out. And again, if you stay zoomed out too long, that's where you get stuck in analysis paralysis. But if you zoom in too long, you lose sight of the bigger picture and you can get really focused on one thing without realizing that it's not the most important thing in the system anymore. So what you're, what this really is a mindset, which is about building your fluency and switching between these modes. And I probably do it in like every conversation I have. Um, but you can also do it in a more structured way. Like, Hey, we're going to zoom out now. Um, but it's really, you're constantly going back in between this mode. And I think it's one thing that really, distinguishes like systems thinkers and designers is that they're like, Oh, that connects to this bigger thing. And wait, that gives me an idea for something we can try and back and forth and back and forth. This is so helpful, Deirdre. We've got some great questions coming in. And by the way, I forgot to mention to all of you joining in the last uh, 10 minutes, we will open it up to questions. So I do want you to keep giving them. So Deirdre building on this, uh, can you say a little bit more about how individuals can practice this mindset? You said it's a switching so how do you know when you've maybe spent too much time zoomed out or when you've, or when it's time to zoom in and vice versa? Like, how do you, what are some clues that you probably need to switch? So for me, I can, the zooming, the, the analysis paralysis, I really think is like a feeling. It's that feeling. It's a uh -huh. stuck, stuck feeling you're stuck. when you're just mm -hmm. like, this is, <laughs> I see too much. It's overwhelming. <laughs> Where do I go from here? And it's like, it, it's also a feeling of swirl when you're like, okay, we've okay. gotten mm -hmm. here and we haven't really made any progress. And for me, that's a moment to zoom back in. And I have lots of methods and ways that I do that. So usually if I'm working on a project, I'm like, okay, I need to go back to our research and remind myself, like, what, what is it that people talked about? Or maybe I need to do another interview, or maybe I need to just build something like a team or like, it's Hey, tangible. you know what? Let's all, yeah. yeah. Let's all take an hour and just get something out of your head onto and make something tangible. So there's different, and those are all ways of zooming in. Like, like the zoom back into a person and their needs. Let's make something uh, tangible. Like what's one idea this brings up for me. And that's how you can get out of that mode. And similarly, when you're in the zoomed in mode, I think it's more of a feeling of like, you've been in like tunnel vision for a while. You've been like in the details. We're doing this thing. Maybe it's time to take a step back and be like, wait, what have we learned about the bigger system? Is this still the biggest priority? Um, is there something else we want to include? Is there a new perspective we want to bring in? Who should we get feedback from? Um, so you have this, uh, you can feel that kind of like when you've been in super focus, almost like flow zoom, zoomed in mode, and it's time to take one step back. And there's ways to ways like feedback um, to do that. Great. That was so helpful. We have some folks saying like, this is, I feel, I identify with this feeling right now today. <laughs> and you know, what's interesting in both of your answers, Deirdre, there was an underlying feeling you met, like that's one of your indicators. There's actually a feeling or emotions in this is part of what guides your thinking. Yes. And I think that's part of what comes with like the fluency and practice is like uh -huh. getting that sense of 
Mm. and name like I'm stuck I'm in swirl we haven't gotten anywhere I'm overwhelmed okay let's try something let's Let's go back to interviews let's do something yeah yeah what I heard in both your answers too is um you brought back in a human perspective what is kind of like what is your mindset and how you're keeping the human centeredness in mind when you're switching zooming in and out uh it's similar so what part of that is again coming back to like the end stakeholders sometimes. So again, go back to the school system. It's like continue with bringing back, like, how's this going to make this a better experience for students? That's one way when you're also like way out in the yeah. world, in the realms of like the financial model. And you're like, hang on, <gasps> what is the purpose of this? And what is it for? And like, how yeah. can I, are the questions I'm asking ultimately going to drive to that? But it's also about, again, it, systems design is about keeping other stakeholders in mind too, like, oh, what, how are parents going to react to that? Or like, how do we get their input? Um, or what about the needs of administrators? Have we thought about that yet? Um, so it is about looking. And again, that's one way to just ground yourself. Yeah. The systems are saying. so mm-hmm. complicated. They're so complicated. And one like constraint you can use when it is uh, coming back to people, coming people. back to the needs that's of people. That's what I'm people. hearing you say. Yeah. So thank you. So we've recapped. So that's one tool. We're talking broadly, this mindset of zooming in, zooming out. Um, we are going to talk about another tool, but before we do that, I have, I have, there's a great thread. People are asking what makes something a system? Like what are the qualities of a system? And someone's also mentioning um, Danielle Danella's work, which I know is also something a uh, 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 person you also uh, respect and admire for, was it? Yeah. Thinking in systems. By yeah, Danella, Danella Mello. Meadows. Mm-hmm. Meadows. Yeah. Um, great resource for uh, an inspiration for systems thinking. Um, okay. So a system at its most basic is anything where the sum is greater than the whole of its parts. Okay. So your cell phone is a system because if you took all the parts apart, you would no longer have a phone. You couldn't call anyone, um, even though all the parts are still in your room. It can only yeah. call someone or we know people don't even use phones to make phone calls anymore. You can only text someone or access Instagram when all the pieces are together in a okay. certain way. And so systems design is about designing those inner, those intersections. So like in a physical product, that's like, where did these things physically fit together? How does the software yep. work with the hardware? Um, but that also is true in so there's small examples of systems. You can have two things, put them together. They do something that neither of them can do on their own. You already have a system, but there's also yep. huge systems like climate finance education system are all like systems, systems within the healthcare system there. And those are all systems within system. Any one hospital is a system, probably one department, the healthcare, mm-hmm. the electronic records, and then zooming in. And then the whole healthcare U S healthcare system or global healthcare system. So it is. And again, I just zoomed in and out, in and out. even yes, in explaining did. that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so you. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how to make those systems tangible. Cause you're right. They can be, they can be small. It can be just be two. Um, and so I know I understand another tool that you encourage a lot of people to adopt into their, their, their way of thinking is systems mapping. Uh, so let's, can you tell us about what this is, why it's helpful and, and some ways to get started? Sure. So systems mapping is a basic tool of systems thinking, systems design, and in particular is a helpful tool for zooming in and out. Um, Whereas that's a mindset, this is an actual tool. Um, There are many, many, many ways to create systems maps. And in fact, there's no wrong way to create one. Systems maps help you zoom out and visualize the bigger picture and and then identify where you want to zoom in, like where you have a question, where you want to learn more, where you want to try an experiment. So a simple example of that might be to create a systems map, blank piece of paper, write down everyone involved. So let's, if you go back to that onboarding experience, you've got a new hire, HR, their manager, their new team, and any employee resource groups, recruiting, the technology team, et cetera, et cetera. So just first starting by naming them. This is also where your question earlier about stakeholders, like push yourself to think past the obvious, obvious. obviously the new hire, but also yeah, technology, how they, how do they get their computer? Um, 
now, uh, and now you can draw the connections between them. So who works with who, who's responsible for what, like who makes decisions. Um, you could spend five minutes doing that, or you could spend many weeks doing that. Um, because the goal isn't to create a perfect map and it most importantly does not have to be beautiful. Um, the goal is really to learn about the system and see things in a new way and come away with a new question. So like, maybe you realize that this is not, this is a real example that recruiting never talks to that person's manager. So information about the candidate gets lost in the hiring process. And people feel like I keep telling you the same things about myself. Um, or you really start to wonder what is the experience like of the new hire? So you decide to do a few interviews. So it's really about walking away with a new question, um, or a new idea. Um, and the most important thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't have to be right to be useful. The value is in like, yeah, that's, I appreciate that. Cause one of the comments was, you know, they can seem so chaotic and that would, and that is true. That would feel if you're trying to get it right. But what I hear you saying, it's, it's really to, to learn, to be able to ask a question. What else? What, why else do you use systems, systems maps? So there are some situations in which you might spend a lot of time trying to create like a really robust systems map. If mm-hmm. you're trying to get a lot of people on the same page or to see the system in a similar see. way, like, yep. like, hey, we all need to have a shared understanding of like, how our onboarding process works or what market we're, we're operating within. Um, so you might actually like really be trying to like be really comprehensive, but that's one version of a systems map and they can be really complex. Yeah. And I ultimately though, like there, if someone was like, here's my systems map, like, great. What did it, what did you learn from making it? What question did you have? What new idea did you have? And those are the ones you can also like make one quickly, make one, ask someone else to make one, compare them. You can uh, ask someone to build on yours and it'll give you new perspectives, new questions, new ways of seeing the system. Um, And again, you can do that in like 20 minutes. And I can almost guarantee you'll learn something that you didn't quite see. And that's the point. The point is like the ultimate map. It's what you learned along the way. And you can make many of them to do that. And that's, this is, thank you so much, Deirdre. And, and I, I heard you say too, like, this is just a starting point. There's many ways to do it. Is this part of your ongoing practice? Like, do you just do this at the beginning? Is this just an ongoing tool whenever you're dealing with a challenge? It's definitely helpful in the beginning um, when you're just trying to like get the lens. I mean, we make these in different ways all the time. Like, understanding our client organization and who who are they, how do they work? How do they fit into the industry they're in or understanding some more nuance of like the actual challenge we're working on. Um, but again, like you might do interviews and then be like, wait, how does that fit into our systems map? Or, um, I taught a course once on thinking about systems mapping in relation to early education. You can also use a systems map to come up with an unexpected idea. So you might be like, hang on, like, early, like a huge player in early education is, uh, like babysitters and teacher, but they have no connection or, or the healthcare system, but none, they have no connection to the school system. We don't often think of them as huge stakeholders. So what if we like built something that intentionally connects those to one, some of our more formal systems, I see. So you so can that, also, I, I, what I heard you say is it's, in the same way, there can be obvious and non-obvious stakeholders. There might be obvious and non-obvious connections within systems or how you might think about them, exactly. especially when mapping. You can reveal where there's a lack or a gap in, in the system. Yeah. And you can either be like, is that right? Like, is that maybe intentional? I just don't know. Is that intentional? Yeah, yeah. Like, let right. me go talk to someone or see who might know more about that. Or maybe there's actually something to be designed here. That's great. So we we are going to start to switch to questions. Um, we have a lot, but I'm going to go with one that's uh, a theme that's come up that I know you're also passionate about, Deirdre. And it's it's just this idea of careers in systems thinking. Like, are there uh, are there opportunities for like where where are different industries where one might apply systems thinking? Um, and if someone's interested in a career in systems thinking, do you have some advice for them? Definitely. Um, so on the one design. hand, yeah. yeah. On the one hand, like systems thinker or systems designer is not a very common 
job title. Um, so people like me who have it as their actual job title. Um, but I came to systems design from studying many different dis- interdisciplinary mm-hmm. disciplines. So studying cognitive science, working in architecture, ultimately going to business school, none of which are called systems design, by the way, um, but are all all of those as fields bring in many different perspectives to try to get a holistic understanding of a business, a house, or of the, the human brain. And at IDEO, other systems designers are former lawyers, teachers, architects, or worked in publishing, in finance, in software design. But we, what we really have in common isn't our backgrounds, it's our approach and the way that we think. Um, so on the one hand, if you're interested in a career in systems thinking or systems design, you can, you can apply these methods and mindsets in the job you already have or in, in any job, really. Um, there are ways, though, to go deeper, to become more of an expert, to have systems design or change more the focus of your career. So especially in roles that are geared more towards systems change in big systems like climate or education, there are places that are explicitly focused on like, we are trying to change a much bigger system. But again, like that's one version of going deeper. And another version of going deeper is just bringing a different mindset to your meeting tomorrow or um, to your team or to the job that you already have or that you already want. So mostly my advice is, for people to follow your interests, especially if that leads you into new and interdisciplinary perspectives. So another um, analogy I often like to use is like widen your aperture. So like from cameras, like that it's yeah. the similar way of zooming out, widen your aperture, get curious, um, think about the patterns and connections. Like I often say that my career only made sense to other people looking backwards, but it made sense to me moving forwards because I was curious and I I could see through lines. Like, actually there's a lot that architecture and business and psychology have in common. Um, And those are perspectives and many more that I bring into my work every day. So for every person, it'll look a little different. Yeah. Thank you, Jitter. So much support for that thinking interdisciplinary a lot of people recognizing within their own industry or career, a lot of a lot of us in our industries have overlapping interdependent uh, uh, roles and and things that we're solving for, and I think all of us can benefit from zooming in, zooming out. And just to so, build on that, can I build on? Yeah, that? of um, course. This is another you know classic design thinking technique, but is about thinking analogously, and that is a another method of systems thinking because it can be so abstract is to really root it in analogy or something analogous. So this is something that we often see with our, um, you know, it's very common. You've got deeper and deeper into your career. You specialize more and more. Um, and one of the huge values we often bring to, you know, for example, clients in education is like, Hey, we should visit a hospital or actually taking, a hospital clients to an airport and saying Mm -hmm. like, what do you notice here about the entry experience of this airport? It's a very similar system actually, but Mm -hmm. that kind of thinking is thinking in systems. Like what else is similar to this? Um, And then how could I go experience it and bring those learnings back? And it's something that doesn't often happen the deeper you get into a specialized industry. That's so helpful. What a great, great strategy. So um, let's move on to some questions. Um, One that we have quite a lot of uh, is around the relationship between systems and service design. So how does, how does human-centered systems thinking differ? So this comes from Sarah. How does it differ from service design? Or what is the relationship between those two things? A lot of people asking about this. <laughs> There's a lot of overlaps and a lot of similarities. I'd say that similar, also similar to organizational design. Mm-hmm. My answer, I'm a little biased because I really root in systems Thinking is like service design is one way of doing systems thinking, similar to organizational design. You're designing an organization. An organization is itself a very complex system and it's part of many other larger systems. So like the processes of service design and thinking holistically and like, what are all of the, and I haven't studied service design, but what are all of the, um, how do all these things moments. fit together? Okay. All these mm-hmm. moments, all of that is very similar and it is systems thinking applied to a new service, a new product, a new experience. Um, and, uh, but again, like it's a zoomed in 
way of practicing this. So there's tons of overlaps. I think systems design is just like the bigger, um, it's the bigger mindset or yeah. Yeah. The bigger mindset. And, um, it's not always in relation to an organization or a service or a product or an experience. So, so anyone in the field of service design could easily benefit and apply some of these systems thinking within it and be very relevant is part of what I think I'm hearing. For sure. Um, yeah. or to more, int- more intentionally like incorporate these tools into how you do service design. Um, especially with some of the tools in the course that help you again, zoom in and out, see different perspectives, mm-hmm. um, and think about the bigger picture of the service model uh-huh. and what you're working with in there's, so there's lots of similarities, um, and overlaps in a yeah. good way. Yeah. Like one of, we didn't talk about it today, but um, I know you talk about it in our course, which is you talked about systems map, which is one type of way of capturing a system. You can also do what's called process maps. So, so capturing a system as it relates to processes, which can be very similar to service design. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. So I have another topic and we have a lot on this one. And I know Deirdre, you've got, it's about stakeholders with conflicting interests. So I'm going to share a couple angles into this. So um, Adharsh is asking, you know, what if it's just, what if a stakeholder is working against the well-being of a system or, or um, we have Holly asking what if stakeholders who do, you know, are not aligned with the current systems or, or change agendas. Do you have any advice for how to think about working with stakeholders who may have conflicting interests and points of view? Yeah. I mean, there's no silver bullet solution to that. It's difficult, uh, difficult, uh, and super common problem and something I'm somewhat obsessed with in thinking about systems design and organizational design yeah. is so many things come back to incentives. Um, and often those incentives are unspoken. Um, so there's another tool in the the course about the iceberg model, which really helps you get down to that level of like, what are the invisible and visible incentives that are operating in this area? And there's lots of ways, again, none are easy, but um, to start to tackle that one is simply by like naming and seeing them and having that, like whose job Mm -hmm. is it? (laughs) Or like, what are the competing incentives? And then um, who has power to shift them or um, like what would it take to shift these or to bring incentives more into alignment? And sometimes that is cultural and sometimes it's a more tangible incentive so that sometimes the solutions aren't simple. Um, You mentioned this in your system mapping, you did talk about one way you could draw your map is to identify where power lies. Yes. Super important. So thinking about like Mm -hmm. who's most impacted by this system and where does power Mm -hmm. sit within the system and where does my power sit within the system too? That's another way to like get out of the analysis paralysis or the complexity is to bring it back to like, okay, I cannot fix climate change, but like, what can I do in my daily life or on my team or my organization towards a bigger goal? And so that's another, another, um, lens you can use intentionally in a systems map is identifying who has power, who doesn't have power. How might we incorporate people who are impacted without power to be more a part of decision-making or part of the process. And there's one other thing I mentioned earlier, I wanted to name, which is sometimes, sometimes systems mapping or bringing everything to the surface can also help people align incentives. So sometimes you might have like one department is like, this is super important. Another one is, this is super important. And they are both important, but they're conflicting. And so another way to do that is to bring everyone together and say like, hey, we're going to step back. (laughs) We're going to talk to like customers or students or whoever it is. We're going to share those stories and we're going to look at the system from a different point of view so that everyone might be able to see like, oh, I see how what I'm doing relates to that um, or has an impact on that. And also how it's a little bit in tension with that and like bringing that to the surface or help bringing, helping people to have a shared mental model of the, of the choices and the options is very, can be very effective. That's such a great, that's such a great tip. And it goes back to just the the whole theme of this discourse to human centered. Uh, these tools are not only for the impact that you want to create in the systems, but it's also for bringing together people and stakeholders within the systems to understand what is their shared interest, 
where where might conflict lie and why. Um, I we only have time for one more question, and it's going to stay on this thread, and it's around working with others. So we, there's quite a few different questions around bringing the systems thinking along, introducing others in your team, in your org, to this way of thinking, to this practice. So Paul is asking, any advice on making this process more familiar or accessible to others? Or Doug is asking, how do you break down barriers to around to, to adopt some systems thinking approaches? Yeah, so I'll stop there. Sure. Um, I mean, one way is to use the tool, invite people into the tools. So mm -hmm. like literally make a systems map, show it to your colleagues. Does this match your mental model? Does this bring up any new ideas for you? What if we did an exercise like this with our team? So there's some like small ways you can start to do that um, and make more space for it. Or, Hey, I was getting really curious about like other teams. So I interviewed them and turns out we're doing a lot of the same things. We're not talking to each other. Um, so like bringing it is mm. that process of like how to bring other people along, how to help other people take a step back and then take another step forward, zoom in and out um, can be very important and, um, and effective in how you're, yeah, how you're engaging people. Um, again, not, oh, and, and again, thinking about sometimes I was going to say, sometimes when you do come into conflicting incentives, you can try to shift them. Another approach is to accept them as a constraint. It's like, that is a constraint that we're working around now. What ideas does that give us? And actually like, not pushing again. That's another approach. So there's different ways to be like, okay, Hank, what if we just accept that as a constraint? Now what? Now, now where do we have power or where, where else could we, what, how would we design around that? So that's another interesting way to sometimes, um, like kind of flip, flip your own mental model of like how to intervene in a system. This has been so wonderful. And Deirdre, we're, we're running out of time and I, I'm sorry, we can't get to all the questions <laughs> folks are ask, asking. Um, I'll have one last question for you, Deirdre, but I do want to just summarize where we've been and just share a little more info uh, for folks who might be interested to learn more. So uh, we've been joined today by Deirdre Sermonaro talking about human-centered systems design and systems thinking. Uh, we've just scratched the surface on, on some a key mindset, which is all about zooming in and zooming out and a tool that you can start to bring into any complex challenge or into uh, a holistic uh, space that you're working on. And that was around systems mapping. Deirdre, any last things you wanna just uh, put a point on with regards to? Uh, I was just gonna say, if today in this call, you were like, I think I'm already a systems thinker. <laughs> you are, yes, like this is a, and, and you can do it more intentionally. You can bring more people into it and I, like wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. Like, I really think this is a really powerful tool that leads to more effective, more holistic, more ethical solutions when we're taking in the bigger picture and then not getting paralyzed there, but using that as fuel for design innovations and testing new ideas. Um, so yeah, and you can do that, you know, obviously there's a lot more in the course, but also something you can do in your next meeting, in your next, uh, in, in, a, in to, and tomorrow. Yeah, I like even, I, yeah, all of us, we can try a little moment of zooming in, zooming out. So Deirdre, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, she did mention the course. So if you are curious to learn more and go a little bit deeper, Deirdre is uh, the instructor in our newest course called Human Centered Systems Thinking. Um, and if you'd like to learn more, I invite you to check it out. It launches on April 16th. Uh, you'll learn a holistic approach to problem solving that keeps people at the center. You'll learn more about the tools and mindsets that Deirdre shared today. And for those of you joining us live, we do have a special offer on the screen. I welcome you to check it out. And with that, all of us, you can all learn more at idou.com slash systems. Uh, and Deirdre, last question for you is simply, what advice would you have given your younger self? What advice do you wish you had when you were starting your career? Um, some of it is actually advice I got, which was, uh, do the next right thing. That was the most helpful thing in my career has been, don't worry too much about like your 10 year plan. Um, especially if you're a systems thinker, you have a lot of different op like different interests. You see things across. And the advice I got randomly from Anderson Cooper at my graduation was focus on doing the next right thing. And what are the, um, 
what are the elements of the thing you want to do next and using that as a constraint um, rather than getting overwhelmed by the longer term, bigger picture, unless you want to be a doctor, in which case go to medical school. But um, for a lot of people who this mindset is curious and familiar, do the next right thing has been the most powerful advice that has um, been uh, helped me make decisions in my career. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Yudra. And thank you everyone for joining us. We'll hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.